Matters. I'm your host, Brendan O'Connell. Well, a year or so ago, uh, Stephen Tyler came out with a book entitled, uh, Does the Noise in My Head Bother You? And in it, in a footnote, was mentioned uh, a lady's name who, uh, turns out, um, had his biological child that was aborted. And it's quite a story. Um, the lady's name is Julia Holcomb. And this happened about 38 years ago. And uh, we have Julia in studio with us. She's come all the way from Texas via the nice, cool summer lakes of uh, New Hampshire. And uh, we're going to have Julia tell her story of how she met Stephen, how she grew up, how she met Stephen, how it was that they uh, uh, lived together for three years, and uh, the subsequent abortion that occurred right here in the city of Boston, and, um, and everything else that goes along with. And then off in a, we're going to do a two-part series. Uh, the second part, we'll talk about the event, and then also uh, the redemptive nature of how she's uh, led her life since then. So welcome, Julia Holcomb. Thank you for having me, Brendan. Julia, I, I'd like to ask you, first of all, how is it that you came to uh, speak out about uh, this situation? Many years, uh, you've kept this quiet to yourself for many years. How did you come to speak out about it? Uh, it's not something I ever expected to speak about in a public way. I had been silent about it throughout my married life. I have six beautiful sons and a daughter. And I had never told my children about my relationship with Stephen or my abortion. It was something that had caused me a great deal of grief, and I didn't want them to carry that same burden. So I had remained silent. Stephen made it public in his book, his first book that he wrote, but he left my name out, so I felt like I didn't have to answer it. In his second book, when he became an American Idol judge, he mentioned me. And after that, Star Magazine wrote an article where they mentioned my name, and they used a photograph of me, and my oldest son saw it, read the article, and recognized his mother. And I had to give my first silent no more talk at home in my living room with my children. And we shed a lot of tears that night. It was very difficult. My children were very loving and forgiving of me. When they heard about my past, they were very surprised and shocked, but they, um, I remember I had one that was a senior in high school that year, and he was about to graduate. He's a big six-foot-two boy, red-headed wrestler, and he came up, threw his arms around me, and he said, Mom, I love you and I forgive you. And I knew at that point that I could be silent no more. I wanted to make sure that I let uh, people know that I, with all my heart, I regretted this abortion and that I wanted to let people know that God had been a pathway for healing. God had taught me to embrace life and become a guardian of life, and that that's possible for other post-abortive women as well. Mm -hmm. Now, certainly, uh, I, I'd like to go back and take a look first at uh, in the environment that you grew up, which uh, perhaps you could tell us uh, your family growing up, what you remember, and, and things of that nature. Could you tell us something about that? We had a very difficult family background. My father abandoned my mother when I was just a toddler. I don't remember my father being at home. I remember the first time I saw him, he came to visit and he brought a puppy with him and he spent the day. And it was like heaven that day that daddy was there and I was thrilled. But at the end of the day, he said he had to go buy a pack of cigarettes and he didn't come home. I don't remember how long it was before I saw him again. But my mother and he finally divorced, and she remarried a man who was an alcoholic and an atheist. And, you know, she was an ideal mother at that time. She had been a school teacher. She took us to church. She prayed with us, and I remember that she tithed faithfully. But after that second divorce, she was very disillusioned and broken in her. She just changed. She made a decision to stop attending church. And it's hard to imagine that a decision like that could change your life so dramatically, but it was as if she walked away from God and our family just changed. So the second marriage, the, the fellow was an alcoholic. The first marriage, he, it, he was a gambler and a womanizer. Yes, he was. And, and then your mother, after the second marriage, she had a nervous breakdown. Is that correct? She did. She, she had a she just kind of 
walked away from her faith. And mm -hmm. after that, she didn't remarry my second stepfather right away. They just lived together. And our life became very unsupervised. And I felt that I almost didn't have a place where I belonged anymore. I was in the way at home. And I met a girl who had access to backstage parties. Mm -hmm. And I was just uh, almost 16 when I met her. Well, let me ask you one other thing first, though. You had a tragic car accident in your family's life. What, how did that come in? How did that fit in the picture? Well, my grandparents, my, was it, my grandmother was a first grade, my first grade teacher. She was a sweetest woman, and she took us camping with my grandfather at Crater Lake. We spent two weeks there. It was, mm. it was probably one of the happiest memories of my youth. But on the way home from that camp out, we were in a car wreck. My grandfather had a heart attack at the driver's wheel, mm. and my brother was killed. And I woke up in a hospital. And um, you and you had one other sibling. My and... sister was in the car accident as well. And so your your brother was he the middle or the youngest? Or he the was most? the youngest. He was and the he youngest. He was just ten years old, and he died in that car accident. And just how, on the way to the how hospital. How old were you? I was about. 13. About 13. And your older sister? She was uh, 16 months older than I was. She was. And so that uh, car accident helped fuel the... It did. It, it was just a, a lot of tragedies all at once for my mother to bear. And she, um, you know, she was just grieving and broken. Her spirit mm -hmm. was... She had been through a lot of difficulties, and I think she just kind of gave up mm -hmm. and felt like she didn't... She almost, I think she just lost her faith for a while. She lost her way. Mm -hmm. And it was at a difficult time for me because I was a teenager. And, mm -hmm. and that's when I met this young woman. And this young woman that you met, what, uh, did she lead you into rock and roll or something? Or what she the... sure did. Uh, she, was, she was older than I was, and she you, told me that... You if, were 15 at the time. I was 15. I wasn't allowed to go with her to a concert until my 16th birthday, which was just one month before I met Stephen. That was, was that your mother's rule, or was that... No, it was because of the law. The like, law. she would have taken me if the laws would have allowed me to go, but because in, of the law... In I, Portland, In Portland, Oregon. yes. This, uh, uh -huh. she, she was going to concerts a lot, and she would take young girls with her, and uh, I was invited to go. At that age, I was too foolish to understand the danger that I was in. I just thought it was exciting. I knew that I idolized Aerosmith and Steven Tyler. I'd, I'd seen his picture on his album cover. I'd listened to the song Dream On, and when she told me that I could go to the Aerosmith concert, I thought, this is fabulous. I wanted to go, and I hoped that I would meet Steven. And when we met, it was like my world just came to a stop, and we just... Something happened between the two of us. We, I, I went home with him. No one asked where I was at my, my home. I, my supervision was just not there. My mother allowed me to travel with him. And within a few months, I was moved to Boston and living with Stephen. And you were living in uh, Brookline on Beacon Street. Is that correct? Uh... The first apartment we had was in, on Beacon Street, but it wasn't the Brookline apartment it was in, yeah it was a different place but it was a small little basement apartment and I, I moved there with Stephen and we had been there for a short time and he came to me and told me that he needed to become my legal guardian so that I could travel with him and tour I didn't really understand what all of that meant yeah. why would he do that what what is it because you were that at that point you were 16 years old is that correct yes I was barely 16 he wanted to take me on tour with him, and mm -hmm. he told me that it was illegal for me to cross state lines unless he was my guardian and I was his ward. I didn't think my mother would sign the papers, um, but he came to me very shortly after that, and he had the papers signed. And I remember almost being devastated. I felt kind of abandoned. and By, by uh, your mom. By my mom. And I felt... I wasn't sure what it meant because I knew we weren't married, but I was, uh, he was like a parent to me, and yet we were in a relationship together. And I wondered how it would all turn out. I felt very vulnerable. It, he, I asked him, how did you get her to sign those papers? And he said, I told her that I needed them for you to go to school. And, you know, I didn't go to school. I toured with him. I remember 
sitting on the side of the stage and listening to Stephen sing and and just traveling with the band and mm. I remember thinking I was I was fortunate and that um, I just how many how many girls get to travel with a rock star right That's... I, I I was I was young enough and and uh, foolish enough to think that that this was a, a fortunate situation I didn't realize that I would be taking a path that would take me to the brink of death and that I would be lucky to survive and that I would have um, it end in tragedy. Mm -hmm. So now you were touring all around the, the country um, and uh, there was a, at some point uh, um, S Stephen um, uh, started talking to you about having a child with you is what, what what was that how did that all come about and what uh... I was taking the birth control pill when we were first together and we had visited his family's resort in New Hampshire it was near Lake Sunapee and they had a little resort mm -hmm. and we had spent some time there and it had inspired in Stephen a desire to have a family because he began speaking with me about having a child and I thought that was wonderful I I was convinced in my mind that he must truly love me if he wanted to have a baby with me. I loved children. I remembered my cousins and I said, yes, I would love to have a baby. He uh, threw my birth control pills out the window of the hotel that we were staying at. And looking back at it, I, I sometimes have wondered why did he toss them out the window? And I wonder if it was just so they wouldn't be in the room the next day to rethink that decision. But we became open to life in our relationship at that point. And I didn't get pregnant right away, but within about a year, I became pregnant. And how old were you when that decision was made, when he threw the... Were you 17 by then, or...? I'm not sure. I was probably close to 17, mm -hmm. but I may still have been just 16. Mm -hmm. I, it, I don't remember it being very long after I came before I was off the pill. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, I personally wonder whether um, being a ward uh, and having sex, if that would be statutory rape or not, get it from state to state, I know the law, there are different ages state to state, but... Uh, I'm sure that there were um, illegal things about our relationship. But nobody was asking Stephen those hard questions. He was very wealthy and, and famous. People loved him everywhere we went. And he just didn't get a lot of, um, he wasn't asked to answer for, for those things. A lot of tough questions. So then um, you, um, you went up to New Hampshire uh, to meet his parents and I guess his grandmother, is that correct? And After I became pregnant, he told me that we would marry. and. He said that we needed to marry because of um, I was his ward and I had become pregnant. I didn't care why he wanted to marry me. I just knew that I loved him and I was excited about the wedding. I thought my life couldn't get better. I was going to marry Stephen and we were going to have a family and this was wonderful. When we told his parents about our decision to marry and about um, the situation I was in expecting a baby, they were understandably concerned. His father was a very serious man. He spoke to Stephen privately about his displeasure in our situation and he made it clear to us that it wasn't something that he was supportive of. His mother was very sweet. I remember admiring and loving her. She thought we would have a hard time but that we would just have to get through it, that we would face it one day at a time. and. He asked his grandmother if she would give us her ring to marry with. She was very old and frail, and she was um, in failing health. And he was the oldest son of an Italian family, and he asked her for her ring. And she looked at us, and she didn't think we looked like a very good bet. Um, she said that if we divorced, the ring would leave the family, and um, she declined. That night was very difficult. I remember leaving the house with Stephen and we argued over a ring. I remember telling him that we should just go and get a ring at a store and get married and things would be fine. And he had had a change of heart and I could see that that wasn't going to happen. We were just kind of in limbo. I didn't really know where it would all end, but I could see that I had 
I was not going to be the one to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. So he had uh, second thoughts when he was somewhat rejected by his grandmother and father, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, uh, rejecting your relationship, uh, um, a potential I, marriage relationship. I think perhaps he had had it in his mind that I would stay there with them while I was pregnant. And I don't think that was something that they were ready to take on a responsibility like that. I'm not, I'm not sure everything that, that was discussed, but I could tell that, that his, uh, his discussions with them didn't go like he had hoped. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, so you were pregnant, and it's the fall of 1975, and you're staying on Beacon Street in Brookline, uh, not far from here, right, the studios. And, uh, and uh, tell us what happened uh, while you were there. Why were you there, and was he there with you, or was he on the road, or what? what we came uh, back together, and, you know, we had had some arguments after the, after the trip, to, the New trip Hampshire. to Hampshire, and he made the decision to to go on the road and leave me behind. I was very young still. I was, I had no car, no driver's license. I had dropped out of high school to tour with him, so I had no education. I had no money of my own, and he left me to travel on the road, and there was just a little bit of food in the house. After He would call every day, and he would just check on me, see how I was doing. And after the food ran low, I remember telling him I needed to go grocery shopping. And he told me he would send uh, a friend that had worked for the band and had one time been a band member, Ray Tobano, would come to the house and take me grocery shopping the next day. And I hadn't been out of that apartment in weeks, so I was excited. And I, there was a little window that was looking over the street. And I remember waking up early, getting ready, and sitting by the window waiting for Ray to come. And I, I remember watching him walk up the stairs. And I remember letting him into the apartment. And I don't remember perfectly, with perfect clarity, everything that happened. But I did wake up in a fire. In a fire? We did not go grocery shopping. I don't know. Ray was gone when I woke up. And the apartment was filled with smoke. I was laying on a sofa. And I was choking. I could hardly breathe. There was so much smoke. I couldn't see anything in the room but smoke. I stood up. And I tripped over a table that was in front of the, the couch, and I fell on the floor. And on the floor, there was more air. It was down low. And I could breathe. And I made the decision uh, to kind of run crawling on the floor to uh, the front door. And when I got there, it was locked. There were several bolts on the doors. And now, now, you would normally open that door, right? There I was, had opened it to let Ray in. There was the apartment. a key lock, a deadbolt, and then. There was also a bar lock that would normally just slide out of the way. Stephen had a lot of locks on the apartment because he had kept drugs in that apartment. And he wanted to have an opportunity to have the door open slowly if somebody like the police came. And so there were a lot of locks on that door, and the bar lock wouldn't move. I couldn't get it to budge. I, I knew that I had to get out of the apartment very quickly, so I started crawling on the floor to the back stairway. There was a stairway that led down to a kitchen, and there was another exit out that way. Out the back of the apartment? Yes. Mm -hmm. When I got to the stairs, there was smoke and flames on the stairs, and I couldn't get down the stairs. And I knew that I wasn't going to get out of that apartment. And I remembered a public service announcement that I had seen, and it said, learn not to burn, and it had talked about staying down on the floor. And it had said that if you're caught in a fire and you can't get out, take refuge in an empty fireplace and open the flue because you can get some air. There was a fireplace in our bedroom. And the flue was already open when I got to it. It was clean. We'd never had a fire in it. And I just crawled there and collapsed in that fireplace. And I can remember the smoke just churning up that chimney and laying there realizing that I was about to die. And I was very frightened. I knew that I was not prepared to die. I felt that I deserved to go to hell. I understood that I had committed very many grave sins. And I was frightened. Over that fireplace was a picture of Jesus. And it was one that had belonged to my grandmother. It was a picture mm -hmm. called The Light of the World. 
And now that's a famous artist, isn't it? Yes, uh, Charles Chambers. Charles and, uh, Chambers, yeah. When my grandmother taught school, that picture had been in every classroom, and every teacher was allowed to pray in school at that time. And she would open the day in prayer. And she, I remember seeing her standing under that picture and opening up the class in prayer. Mm -hmm. um, over time, they were told to take those pictures down. And my grandma was like the last one to do it because she had been there a long time. She was old. The principal allowed her to, to keep it up in the room longer than the mm -hmm. other teachers. But when she retired, he told her to take it home with her. And she did. When she died, it came to me. And it had always been um, something I treasured. And it reminded me of her. And A family heirloom. Kind of, in a way. Mm -hmm. It was like an heirloom to me. And it reminded me of Jesus at that moment when I was facing death. It reminded so, me that he was merciful and that I should pray for mercy. And I remembered the words that when, my, when I was a little girl, if I was naughty, my grandmother made me memorize Bible verses. And if I could memorize the verse, I was forgiven. And mm -hmm. one of the verses I remembered was the words Jesus spoke on the cross. He said, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. And those words came to me at that moment. I prayed them like a prayer. And I, felt, I thought of it as a prayer for mercy. And at that moment, I felt peaceful that I didn't expect to live, but I wasn't frightened anymore. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's something. So um, you're here talking to me 38 years later. and. Uh, well, what happened then? You're in a fire in this apartment, and uh, did the Brookline Fire Department respond, or what, what happened? They must have. Well, a very brave fireman pulled me out of that fireplace, and I was near death. I th um, I've read that they had to revive me. I woke up in a hospital, and I was okay. The doctors had thought that if I survived, I would be brain damaged because I had had so much smoke inhalation. But I was fine. I was able to answer their questions. And Stephen was there in the hospital. And how, how many days later was this? Because he was on the road. Did he come right back, or did he? Uh... He he came back soon. I don't know how long I was in the hospital before I woke up. I woke up in the hospital, and I had been unconscious for some time. Mm -hmm. and when I woke up, um, I was very sick for quite some time. I remember falling back asleep. And I don't know how much time went by before I woke up again. And at, at more, as more time went by, I began to strengthen. And I was allowed to, uh, I was told that I would be able to go home. But before I could get out of that hospital, Stephen came to me and told me that I was going to have an abortion. And I had never considered having an abortion. It was something that I was, I had just never dreamed of having an abortion. I wanted my baby with all my heart. And I was looking forward to having my baby. And I remember just telling him, no, that would not happen. And well, let's, let's do this. Let's, um, uh, we're at the end of this particular show. So we'll, okay. we'll start up the second show. You're in the hospital, and he is asking you to have an abortion, Stephen Tyler. And um, I had uh, one or two questions before that, though. Uh, okay. Uh, just quickly, um, were your lungs okay and the baby's lungs okay? Uh, what, I had what, had, the, what did the doctor tell you that was tending to you? The doctor who was taking care of me, he told me that my lungs were remarkably clear and that he was surprised um, that I was in the state of health that I was. Mm -hmm. I asked him how my baby was, and he told me the baby's heartbeat sounded good and that it was fine and that I should be okay. Mm -hmm. And... So he was a very kind and comforting doctor. And mm -hmm. Okay, well, we'll be back uh, with uh, part two of uh, Julia Holcomb's story. Uh, we're in the hospital, and uh, uh, S Stephen Tyler has now broached the question, would you have an abortion to Julia after she has just woken up uh, and, and getting her, her uh, faculties together as far as uh, surviving a fire? <laughs>
Welcome, Dr. Shuping. Great to have you on the show today. Well, thank you. It's great to be here with you. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Shuping, um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what has been going on uh, as far as uh, studies with women? Uh, did, where did you first see the problems where there might be a psychological problems going on with uh, post-abortive women? I actually first saw this with my own patients when I was in training. And actually, as a young woman, I had done abortion referrals. I was taught that this was women's right to choose and this was helping women. And so I took one evening of training when I was an undergraduate and learned to tell women, no, no problem, no side effects, don't worry about it. Here's, here's where you go and get your abortion. But when I was in training myself, I saw it wasn't that way at all. And that many women are having abortions they don't want to please other people or under extensive pressure from other people. And a lot of these women are suffering greatly. So I had a patient. Our guest today serves as senior counsel with the Alliance Defending Freedom in its Washington, D.C. office, where he heads up efforts to defend the sanctity of human life. He joined this firm in 2008 and is admitted to the bars in Washington, D.C. and Virginia. He's also a member of the bars of the U.S. Supreme Court and numerous federal circuit and district courts. He practiced law since 1990 and earned his Juris Doctor from Georgetown University Law Center. Well, welcome attorney Stephen Aiden. Hello, Brandon. It's a pleasure to be on your show. Dr. Aiden, uh, you gave a presentation recently over at Harvard uh, University across the river here in Cambridge, Mass. And uh, you mentioned uh, the topic was uh, the top 10 reasons to oppose Roe versus Wade. Could you tell us uh, yeah. the top 10? Well, give us, uh, for instance. I'd be happy. Happy to do that. Thank you for having me on. And by the way, it's. And today we have Rebecca Kiesling. Rebecca herself uh, was conceived in rape, and we're going to let her tell her story. Uh, Re welcome today, Mrs. Rebecca Kiesling. Thank you. Rebecca, could you tell us uh, what, how you came to find out of what your situation was in your life? How did you find out that you were conceived in rape and that sort of thing? Well, I was adopted, and I learned at 18 when I received my non-identifying information. It had all kinds of details about my birth mother, but all it said for my biological father was that he was Caucasian and of large build. Mm -hmm. 